my heart. So I usually am involved with IIT Kanpur in the area of clinical work. Basically problems which might amount to illness or not, hopefully trying to prevent stuff from happening. This is something that's closer because it's, it, it's not only found that the domain of mindfulness has not been, not only been found to be effective in treating uh, illness and chronic distress and pain, but to more well-being people who are otherwise well, who don't have any illness, you know, who just are basically uh, struggling with the whole being, the fact of being human. So let's start.
Now the next milestones are not going to be easy either in space. But by the time you are just in that college, you are having a good time, it will be time to get a job. Taking care of your own finances. Then it's time for marriage. And marriage looks very attractive as a proposition, believe me. I, I, I talk to people every day, you know. I just ask them, you have a boy, you have a girl, who are going to be married. You have the boy's parents, the mother-in-law and the father-in-law, then the girl's parents, the mother-in-law and the father-in-law. And if you ask all those six people, and I have done this exercise many a times, I ask them, you know, what are your reasons, what do you really want out of this alliance? And there are six different vectors, every person wants something else. So basically we are entering, entering a tug of war. So it's actually surprising if marriage does not cause any adjustment issues. It's again, again a change that we think that we like, we would like. A lot of you would think that you would really like to deal with that change. Believe me, it's not going to be easy. First one year, treat it like you're, you know, coming from home to college for the first year. One year is adjustment period. And so the, the, the problem is we resist change every minute. Every milestone there is change, but change is the only constant. Life is hard for every one of us. Now if that wasn't enough, we are also afflicted with a very, very human disease that's concerned for self-esteem. Now what is self-esteem? What is self-esteem? You, 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 you're, you are a qualified psychologist, so now you, you are what is that? It's like uh, What is the reference point? Who's better looking? 
put stronger, put more power points to the next word, put off to others or the other gender. Other gender or ECP. So our reference point is different. If we find he, we are better than them, if we go, if I am not that good, they are better than you start feeling bad. In fact, it's a joke, you know, that how much will you be earning? You should be at least earning a little more than your wife's husband. That's the key to If if <coughs> if your wife has a brother that is. No? So we are placed in an environment where change is going to be there every step of the way and we fight change to the name. We are constantly comparing ourselves to others to derive our sense of self. That's how we are wired. And on top of this, how many in this room are ultimately going to die? Figure it out. Fairly aware group. More than 50% people raise their hands. All of us are no, that we are going to die. And none of us live a single day. You know, taking cognizance of the fact that we might really not be there tomorrow. I am actually reminded of this sign again every day for the simple reason that I get people asking me to give them certificates for most for illness, rest on medical grounds, that's not a problem. I tell them you can you know, I can give you six weeks rest on medical grounds. Now they'll also come up with something interesting. They'll tell me, doctor you certify me that I will be fit on such and such date, I have to ask because I don't know if I'll be alive that day. I don't know if you'll be alive that day. Why are you asking me to become a fortune? You don't, we, we don't really consider, right? We don't know whether you're going to wake up in the morning or not. See, a million people die every day. Now, so life is hard, life is difficult. We are in an environment, we are wired in a way that we are in constant, that constant crossroads with, with uh, the very nature of life. Now let's consider one more thing. If you consider yourselves, you know these are the nails, these are the teeth, this is the eye, this is the fur. It's not really a lot if you consider that our earliest known ancestors were 3 or 4 million years ago. The current species, human beings, Homo sapiens, right? That's at least 100,000 years old. So, we have to upgrade any app, 100,000 years. Now, to put it into perspective, after calendar shows 2018, that means 100,000 years of Homo sapiens, this current species come model with your vestigial organs, that is the appendix, which you have, don't have any use for has been there for one lakh years. Most of that year, most of that time was spent as hunter-gatherers in caves. For the past 2000 odd years, we went from an agrarian community, living in tribes, to villages, to cities, till the printing press, we were not reading. Till 50 years ago, we were not even sitting for such long period. So, by the way, sitting is a new smoking. We were not designed to sit for such long periods. And the latest in that line of things is, our eyes were mainly, primarily evolved to look at objects in distance. Today, with that rectangle all of us carry in our pockets, most of us are glued most of the time to, to the screen, which is basically creating more myopia. That means, which in the last year, what we have found is, I have never seen anything so dramatic happen that biology has succumbed to technology in this manner that we have seen so near vision that we have seen so much near vision that we have seen so much near vision that we have seen so much Steve Jobs singularly myopia has exploded so has LASIK surgery that's a boom 80% of kids हमारे देश में डेटा कलेक्शन हम करते नहीं, बहुत बड़ा है। But Singapore, Singapore में 
80% of their teenage population has myopia. And this study was commissioned by the National Institute of Health in the US because they found skyrocketing rates of LASIK surgery, basically surgery for refractive errors, taking place. Now just going back, my question is, what chance do you give yourself with your current biological state in front of a hyena, a lion, a tiger, a cheetah, a rhino, a hippo, whichever animal you choose? What chance do we have in a jungle? That's where we've come from. Imagine yourself in an African savanna. See, every animal that I just mentioned is faster than all of us. A rhino runs around 40 miles per hour, a hippo can do 44, a cheetah does 0 to 60 in 3 seconds, it's faster than any Tesla that you can still. We have zero chance. But what did we have? We had a thumb, which is capable of opposition. Just try and see any pet of yours trying to handle a tool. You'll find they won't be able to do it. And the other evolutionary advantage that we had over all the other species was a prefrontal cortex, part of the brain that is not there in any other animal species. This allows us to do what? To reflect, to analyze, to think, to remember, to learn from the past, to project into the future. You know, this is a fantastic piece of machinery and that has allowed the human species to completely dominate the planet. But it comes at a cost. The problem is this is not a neutral computing apparatus. No. <clears throat> Let's imagine the shocker was there for 100,000 years ago. Okay? Now for Shokat's ancestor to have passed, Shokat, let's say Shokat's ancestor was there 100,000 years ago. For Shokat to be sitting here today, it was important that the DNA be passed down. So for that it was, it was important that the Shokat's ancestor who have survived at that point of time. Now let's say Shokat's ancestor comes across a shadow. Now there are two kinds of errors he could have made. One was thinking that that shadow is a rock where actually it was a lion. The other arrow was, it was actually a rock, but he thought it was probably a, a lion. So type 1 error is mistaking a rock for a lion. Type 2 error is mistaking a lion for a rock. Which error do you think he could have, you know, conveniently made and gotten away with it? So he mistake a thousand times and still survive. You make the other mistake just once. Only one error is sufficient. You're done. So we have a negativity bias and that's born of the evolution wiring for survival. Now, how many of you, let's say if I just, you know, take two separate words of world leaders. Tell me what comes to your mind instantly. Narendra Modi, what, what comes to your mind? Okay, you can. No, no, Narendra Modi, which, what comes to your mind? I say his name. What comes to your mind first? Very strong. Strong. What else? Okay, what else? Let's just talk about him in terms of actions, activities. <coughs> Understand, but Bill Clinton 
You know, that was one of the most prosperous eras of the US. His wife just stood for presidency. So that is not really happened to you guys first. One of them is the standard internship. So our, we are basically like Velcro for negative experience. And Teflon for positive experience. Teflon washes out, Velcro sticks. That's the reason all your newspapers have so much, you know, glaringly that, you know, life is having problems. There is a, there's, there's a glitch in every, everywhere. Every page that you open is screaming at you. Uh, the, 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 this is the last problem. The pillar, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we had a smartphone. 20 years ago, 1997, uh, I had a first smartphone. It was a pretty blissful state to be in before that. The only piece of information that one I was exposed to was a newspaper, which I did not read.
design just like any other species. The difference is that if you could just remember, if you could just figure that again, the last end of it, you just pause.
let's say one of those days and I, I if any of you say you haven't had that and I have to tell you you know life sucks I really want to change my life I don't want to be there how can I you know then, then I start feeling okay how, how can I you know really get myself out of this phase and what is happening I have an experience of what I am feeling right now which is not so good I have an, a vision, an idea of how I would like to feel. And I'm constantly trying to search for ways where I can narrow that gap. The problem is every time my mind runs through that circuit, it will highlight the gap. That this is the way I am. This is the way I would like my life to be. Every time we highlight the gap, the gap grows bigger. Because it's not a problem outside the skin. Now the modern day environment comes and complements this more complex. We had an interesting debate recently, a year before last, when DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, which we used as a compendium for disorders, nomenclature. So they were at a solid debate to include Facebook depression as an entity. See, again, I'd like to imagine a time, because it will be difficult for you guys, don't you work kids, imagine a time when smartphone and Facebook were not there. Just imagine. So, what do you get to stand for Vogue or Femina paperbacks, magazines? All right. Internet will be done. Now, when you have a model of photo, you have a photo of your airbrush, you have a photo of your airbrush. You have to tell them that there is something like this. फोटोशॉप और एयरब्रश जैसी कोई चीज होती है अभी आज क्या है आपका आपकी गर्लफ्रेंड से या स्पाउस से ऐसा भी झगड़ा हो जब फोटो खिंचाओगे तो तुम उसको आगे खिंचाओगे तो फोटो तो बता नहीं रही पीछे क्या हो रहा है उसके बाद जब उसको पोस्ट करोगे इफ इट इज वर्थ पोस्टिंग तो प्रॉब्लमली यू विल यूज योर सॉफ्टवेयर स्किल्स सो माई सन डज मोस्ट ऑफ दैट एयरब्रश तो अभी फेसबुक का फेसबुक डिप्रेशन क्यों आ रहा था क्या अभी रोज फेसबुक देखता है उस पर यह पता है कि ये फोटो सबने देर बेस्ट फुट फॉरवर्ड है उसके बाद कंप्यूटर बेस्ट फुट फॉरवर्ड है और इट्स नॉट ओनली योर बेस्ट फुट फॉरवर्ड इट्स योर कंप्यूटिंग स्किल्स बेस्ट फुट फॉरवर्ड ऑल्सो बट नोइंग दिस एंड एक्सपीरियंसिंग इट आर टू डिफरेंट थिंग्स उसका आउटकम ये हो रहा था यार क्या हैपनिंग लाइफ है सामने वाली and my life sucks. So you are looking at the other person's life as it shows on screen. Your own life is not too bad. You don't look at your life. You don't look at your life. You don't look at your life. So anyway, so probably Mark Zuckerberg had something to do. They did not include Facebook. They include Facebook depression and PSN 5. So it's no longer a disorder. No more a disorder. No, not yet a disorder. But it's a problem. So every time our mind is trying to solve an emotional problem, the way that we feel is basically highlighting the issue by how much are we falling short of and that is further aggravating the problem. Now if you just go over the stuff that we have spoken about for so long, do you realize that becoming tired, exhausted, angry, irritable, sad, maybe unwell, feeling a sense of loss, all this is part of the normal tapestry of human life, being human. So the issue is not that there is any way we can escape any of those emotions. The problem is that we are trying to solve those emotions. The problem is that we do not want to experience anything that's negative. It's like we want to avoid that aversion which is life-saving in the face of an oncoming car misfires when it's something, if you're feeling sad, you want to distract yourself. If you're feeling anxiety, you want to distract yourself. Now, let's just consider, I just say, okay, I just give you the example when you dig and the gap widens. How many of you have an occasional drink? Please be honest here. 30% that's not, no, okay, 20%. Good. So, who, which of you who does have an occasional drink, drinks for the taste?
taste of it. Great. You drink for the taste of it. We need to meet, meet after the session. <laughs> <laughs> so most people drink to alter their state of mind. Right? So when you're going to a place, we might I you know where I think okay, I'll be going there, meeting people. There are a lot of people I don't know, you know. So if I have a drink, I'll be a little more relaxed and more receptive. At times, I'm going to be meeting a lot of people that I do know. So I know I need to have a drink before I meet them. It is even harder. So, so that's all right. If you do it occasionally, it's, it's all right. But if you do it regularly to change your state of mind from what you're currently experiencing, you are going to land in a substance abuse disorder. Alcoholism begins with that. That every time what you're experiencing, you do not want to experience that emotion, you have to change the state of mind and you seek refuge in a bottle. Now let's say I have a problem with speaking in public. So I am anxious about coming and speaking to an audience and I become a Alright? My wife has a... She's anxious about flying. So she pulled onto the seat so tightly that I think you'll yank off one of the side rails of the seat. I ask her in time, you know, that's the, so I poke her, you know, by holding so tight, how will it happen? So then she'll tell me, you know, you keep yourself happy with yourself. <laughs> I shut up. Point is, I, I have anxiety. She has anxiety. As long as I have anxiety, I'm a slightly anxious person. So, as long as I accept the anxiety, I let the anxiety be, and I still do what is needed, I'm able to handle the anxiety. At times I will not be doing a good job of it, at times I will be doing a fairly decent job of it. But if I stop from speaking in public, if she stops flying because of that fear, then it becomes an anxiety disorder. So I've just given you two examples where wanting not practicing aversion, not wanting to experience any negative emotion, which is a natural part of being human can lead to illness. Let's just go before the comment. Yeah. Okay, let's let's watch this slide. The next slide, the next time play automatically. Next time. Hold the paper.
So we just saw what the fly did to the samurai warrior. And now I think the whole concept of our not wanting to experience any discomfort, how it multiplies our degree of all of the difficulty that we experience in life. So the, if you if you just remember China, I think all of you are probably aware of the story of Gautam Buddha and fire in the second arrow. Pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. What do we mean by that? The whole idea is, I have a student, uh, a son of a very dear friend of mine, he was again a student of IIT, a different IIT, just fell and broke a leg playing football. So that is pain that he is always feeling. But what is adding suffering to it? Now I, I was having a chat with him, saying, I'm glad I won't be able to play for the team. Then the next day, so he has thought that I don't know whether I'll be able to run again or not. I don't know whether I'll be able to walk normally or not. Now this is the narrative, the story our minds create. Because they have a negativity bias in the so one is the actual pain. We have the ability most of the time to handle the actual pain or the discomfort. What we do not have the capability of is handling the narrative, the story or the added suffering. Next slide, please. Okay, finally, uh, the, the last part that we are... By the way, you know, homo sapiens means what? Human beings. Current nomenclature, when they start saying it should change to human doings. We are hardly beings, we are most of the time doings. If I ask you to sit without doing anything in this room and take your attendance away, you will be ready to pick a fight, make a complaint, formal complaint against me to the director. Right? <clears throat> now, this was an interesting study done at Harvard. What they did was, iPhone, then I want to work. The idea was you will get a random a message at a random time in the day. You have to tell them, okay, what how are you feeling right now? Two, what are you doing right now? They were given a list of 22 activities from taking care of a child to walking to exercising to having sex, whatever. Broadly covering everything. And the third was, the third question that you had to answer was, are you thinking about what you're doing or are you thinking about something else? Now to put it in perspective, I think it must have happened to a lot of you that you, you know, just left your room early in the morning for a class and then the next moment you realize you've entered that class. Now where were you during all that time? <coughs> it happens to me a lot of times that I sit in my car, push the button to start the car, and the next moment is I am pulling outside my hospital. Where was I in the meantime? So what we have seen, uh, why do you think the phone number has a limitation of 10 digits now or even 7? Because our working memory can only hold that much information. Okay. Now what evolutionarily what we have again by virtue of the whole prefrontal cortex and its companion is we when we start doing learning to do any activity let's say starting to learn to drive it takes up all our conscious attention all our senses are occupied the more we learn that activity it becomes more and more automatic so it's a string of neurons that we fire that is trigger another string of neurons to fire and bring the third string of neurons to fire and very soon you are driving a car or walking, talking on the phone, drinking a cup of coffee all at one, all the same time. So basically we are able to automate. So it's not that machine learning is very new. We are the first species to exhibit machine automatic. We learn and we do it on the unautomatic. Now it's fantastic. It's a cognitive <laughs> achievement. That is what's called Daniel Dilbert. And 
his research at that point of time in that study showed that 47% of the times people were not thinking about what they were doing at that time. That means we call that state the default mode network called mind wandering. And statistically what we have found is that the more one mind wandering time that you spend the more dissatisfied and unhappy you are, or we are, all of us. So it comes at an emotional cost. A lot of times it has happened with me, I don't know, you guys will definitely experience it. I've been looking forward, you know, meeting up with a friend and, and having coffee, catching up something. And you will end up there, and you last there. And I try to think back, you know, what was the taste of that coffee that I was not there. I want that. Mind wandering. Next slide, please. So, now, how does really mindfulness come into all this? So, I've taken a good part, 40 minutes or so, playing the groundwork for something that's fairly simple. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is the awareness that emerges out of paying attention to the present experience and accepting it as it is without judgment. Next slide please. So how does it really help? <clears throat> let's say the first instance. We have a negative thought. Let's take that child who had a fractured leg. He has a negative thought. You know, what it doesn't mean well. What I won't be able to play. Now, the mind creates a story around it. Let's say one of your guides or teachers or friends yell at you. And you, you, are in, you feel that anger rising within you. You can, you probably, if it's a guide or a supervisor, you will probably stay shut and move away. If it's a friend, you might yell back. Now, when you practice mindfulness, we just come to that very shortly. So, what it allows you to do is to observe what is your sensory experience it's like it allows you to be curious about your experience to investigate okay how is my my, my body reacting what thoughts am i currently having let's say i'm, I'm angry so it allows me to say i'm experiencing the emotion of anger i'm experiencing the feelings of anger so it is there's a slight gap between i am experiencing feelings of anger versus i am angry when I say I am angry, I am fused. I am me and anger are the same. Are all are, are one. When I say I am experiencing feelings of anger, that means my awareness is capable of holding more than anger. It allows me to choose to respond wisely to that in that moment. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So let's just see what is this awareness. Okay, so let's let's take a, another metaphor. How many, if, if you've flown, I think nearly everybody would have, when your, your aircraft takes off, you usually the lower layers of the atmosphere early and you rise above the clouds. So no matter what, how much polluted the sky looks, when you're above the clouds, more or less, it's a clear blue. So that is the awareness that we are all capable of. That's always there basically untapped most of the time. And this is nothing new. Gautam Buddha discovered, Buddha was not a Buddhist by the way, so it's nothing religious here. Buddhism came after Buddha. So he discovered and that tradition has really fine-tuned the practices over 2500 years. That this awareness is always there, waiting for us to tap into it. No matter what the weather patterns might be, you might be feeling sad, angry, hurt, 
and were in pain. But that is also being held in that container of awareness. Exactly. So what is what does really mindfulness enable us to do? So in simple terms, in 47 percent of the times we are on automatic fighting. That is what about 50 percent. So if you are aware hai, for hypothetically speaking, we are abandoning them on automatic fighting. Obviously, your success will be able to do it, but your lifespan, actual lifespan will double. Ho because you will be able to live with, in, with conscious awareness choice. The second part is, more practical, we start relating to experience differently. We sense experience and we don't relate from experience, we relate to experience differently. We are all right at times to allow things to be the way they are. We start seeing our thoughts and emotions. Now this is the most important part of what it is. We start seeing our thoughts and emotions as mental events rather than absolute reality. Now if I ask you to imagine a chair, a key to the chair you are sitting on right now, you will be able to very clearly tell me that this chair is different from that chair. That's an imaginary chair. It's a chair that's being constructed out of thoughts. No matter how embellished the imagination is. But when you get a thought, you know, I am worthless. You know, I, I no longer am as good as I was. I am a loser. But these thoughts have a flavor and a characteristic that makes them sound very real. Again, there is no actual chair to compare it from. So what mindfulness allows us to do is to see how many random thoughts our minds are capable of generating. It also allows us to approach negative experiences with curiosity and interest. <coughs>
It has already been shown to be effective in treatment of depression and anxiety disorders. In fact, the National Health Service, the NHS of UK, and the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, that's also the nice guidelines of the UK. The NHS pays for patients of recurrent depression to undergo mindfulness training during the period when they are no longer depressed as a preventive measure to prevent further episodes from happening. Next slide, please. So, how to practice? It's fairly simple. You choose an object of attention. So let's say the object of attention that we have very easily with us is our breath. That's portable, it all times with us. We gather our attention and settle it on the breath. And try to stay with a particular part, either the part of our breath, whether it's the expansion of the belly or at the nostrils. These are the things that I find more convenient. And you try to stay with the breath. Just try to feel the breath. What you will experience is very soon you are no longer with the breath. And then, if, if all, of, all of you have never meditated before, it will be pretty hard for yourself. I, I thought I could stay with it for 20 minutes. It took you probably away after two breaths. And you bring yourself back. Start again and your mind will again wander. You bring yourself back and you begin again and you wander again. It's hard work, it's not relaxation. What it does is it's basically doing a bicep curl with your neuronal circuits. It's like a dumbbell, every time your mind wanders away, you bring it back. It's like doing a, using a dumbbell with your biceps. Please. So, by the way, any guesses how many uh, thoughts do you have in a day? Pretty close. So, range is between 50 to 75,000 thoughts a day. It's a lot of time. A thought a second. A thought a second. Do you really think that we are capable of having a rational, logical, organized, not a second? Most of that is random nonsense. Okay, so next slide, please. Now, what I have found in my practice to be one of the most difficult parts is it's easy to say, you know, begin again. But in our, in our upbringing, whether when we start school, we are told that we should not make mistakes, we should do things right. right? Uh, to be able to understand that, you have to understand the genesis of the whole schooling system. Schools were not a function or not a function of uh, how species grows. Schools more and more basically came into being to supply an industrialized workforce. Right? So basically you, you came into schools, we came into schools to be so that we come out as functional employees where we do what we are told. The problem with that is we consider every mistake a failure. We consider everything, especially the bright ones, the people who have done well. For them, the most difficult thing is that if they are doing something difficult, it is difficult to do. They equate that with failure. Something that is so simple, keeping your attention on the breath. The idea here is not just keeping your attention on the breath. The idea is this is the most important part according to me. It has taken me several years to reach this point where the idea is not to keep your attention on the breath, breath alone. The idea is to wake up every time your attention is wandered. 
and that allows the continuity of awareness to be there. So you are aware when your attention is on the breath and you wake up when the attention is wandered and you smile at yourself but you are also aware that it is wandered and then you bring it back. Now again, this is information understanding. But once you start doing it, you will find that you are not so kind towards yourself. Being able to be kind towards yourself it also requires practice and it requires cultivating that state of being. So, would you guys like to do it? I just have a clip of sitting, just experiencing a taste of mindfulness. We can play that.
what you will find when you are trying to keep your attention on the breath is you will experience judgment for neither liking it or not liking it. You could have had associations, you could have had emotions sliding on the thoughts. And you could have had a commentary, maybe you know, when is it going to end? Wrong place to be. Is that crazy? What this strain of attention does is that it allows us to see, as I mentioned before, our thoughts and emotions as mental events. And also something more that's valuable to every one of us. By the way, uh, how many of you have heard the term multitasking? So nearly everybody. And how many of you think that it's a compliment to give to somebody that you are capable of multitasking? Good. 20%. And the other is, why don't you think it's a compliment? Why can you not? So how do you do three things that I was like I mentioned? Same thing I can do. Yeah, you're right. So we switch attention very rapidly back and forth from a task. Alright? We are not capable, we do not have a quad core or an octa core inside of us. We have a single processor. It does serial processing. And what it does, it is capable of, is rapidly switching from task to task. What this is called is continuous. So what we end up experiencing is continuous partial attention. And that continuous partial attention leads to a sense of constant and persistent, constant and gradually persistent and dissatisfaction. What mindfulness allows you to do is bring back feet. Cultivate the capacity to bring back attention to what you are doing at that moment. Now, it does not mean that you do not allow automatic pilot to be there. No, it is. But you let the automatic automatic pilot be there when you want it to be. It's not that the automatic pilot has hijacked you. For example, your smartphone or the internet. When you sit down with the internet, you designate that I want to plan a holiday and I want to research. And if you do that for an hour and you shut it down, that's perfectly fine. But most of the time what we end up doing is, we stay on the internet for an hour plus we haven't done what we sat down to do and God knows what we've done. So again, the internet is designed to exploit this weakness of or this nature of the human mind. It's not there's nothing neutral in the internet. It's designed to exploit variable ratio response. What gambling casinos exploit, that is what Facebook and every other app exploits. But what other than the apps, what you are doing when you're talking to your friend, when you go out for dinner, or in the rest you have places which now charge you from disconnecting you from the internet. Earlier there was Starbucks which made a Wi-Fi available. Today there are places which charge you because you, it's available at all places. You are always on, on, on connected to the information highway. So there are places where they have, where they have jammers and they will charge you that you will not be able to connect to anybody. Let's say you are going out for a meal. You sit with friends and you are having a meal. You are just there. I think I am very good case for mindfulness. Thank you very much. Thank you for being a wonderful audience.